Pahang, Malaya, the New Zealand High Commissioner to Malaya, Mr. C.M. Bennett, with Mrs. Bennett, arrives for the opening of Kampong, New Zealand. Kampong means town, and the name expresses thanks for the £70,000 New Zealand has given under the Colombo Plan for the development of the settlement. This Kampong, housing 200 families, is one of several being established by the Malayan Land Development Scheme to raise the standard of living of the Malayans. Following the opening, Mr. Bennett has a look round. In all, 2,650 acres have been cleared in much the same way as the early pioneers in New Zealand cleared the bush. In Malaya, they have the advantage that the stumps rot quickly. Each family has been given 11 acres on which they'll grow rubber, the main cash crop of Malaya. Around the houses will be small gardens to grow food for the families. Designed specially for the hot, humid climate, these houses are the standard for the new villages. Not all events are on the official program. The village midwife brings to a proud father the Kampong's first baby, a baby that will grow up in a self-supporting community. Through the Colombo plan, this community has a bright future. Massey Agricultural College at Palmerston North sees plenty of overseas visitors, but it is a bigger event than usual when 34 national flags, one for each country sending delegates, fly on the Massey grounds during the New Zealand meeting of the International Society of Soil Science. Soil scientists are people who get down to the grassroots of world food problems. The conference has brought together 150 New Zealand soil specialists and about 130 from overseas. In the centre front row, the retiring director of the New Zealand Soil Bureau, Mr Norman Taylor, sits with Professor Schaeffer of West Germany. Under the United Nations flag, appropriately enough, a lively international discussion breaks out on the subject of soil profiles. Specialist stuff, you might think, but getting it right could mean thousands of tonnes more food in a place where it is needed. Dr Kellogg, as chief of the United States Soil Survey, knows very well how much soil science has done in the last 20 years to ensure the prosperity of the American farmer. Professor Tavernier of Belgium has strong doubts about one of the soil exhibits. Professor Aubert of France is inclined to agree, but before committing himself, seeks confirmation from Dr. Kano of Japan. Ten days of solid work at the college will promote much more of this vigorous international sharing of opinions. Results of 20 years of New Zealand work on soil are set out in the display hall. Here on the far right, Professor Arakina from Russia talks with Mr. Taylor and others, including Dr. Ayer from India and Professor Wilde from USA. To see New Zealand for themselves, the visitors are taken on tours of both islands, northernmost turning point being the Omahuta Kauri Forest. So at Omahuta, members of the International Society of Soil Science visit the sort of forest that laid down the extensive gum lands of New Zealand's north. The king of the forest is viewed by Professor Clark of USA. After the living forest, the party turns to the stump of a felled giant kauri tree, examining the whitened soil beneath. Dr. Tan Kim Hong of Indonesia sees how 2,000 years of supporting a kauri tree can exhaust the soil. Dr. Johnson of Canada takes a closer look. At nearby Kaikoi at the Grasslands Division substation, New Zealand scientists show that although this was heartbreaking land for early settlers in the north, the gum lands can be converted into good pasture. Over the fence, untreated land bears nothing but fern and scrub. Under the fern roots is white leached out subsoil containing fragments of kauri gum. There are North Island and South Island tours. Crossing Cook Strait on a charter flight, a southern tour has a first view of coastal Marlborough, 
and of the warm and fertile plains round Blenheim, land built over the ages by the meandering of the Wairau River. Appreciating all this from the window is Mr. Ozagur of Turkey. Further inland are the shingle slides of Problem Hill Country. Flying down the Westland coast and looking east, they see the long glaciers that have sent down material to form the South Island Plains. New Zealand is notable in this company as having been the first country to have a detailed soil map of its territory. Beyond Mount Cook are the Moraine Lakes, Tikapo, Pukaki, Ohau. The party flies on south, while near Wellington, a North Island group has been at Taita, visiting the newly built headquarters of the New Zealand Soil Bureau. Within, soil scientists get back to practical work. Steam distillations are set up, a part of the regular routine of analysis. Field work too carries on. There are drainage problems to solve in a Wairarapa subsoil that has curious columns in it. Thanks to soil science and the soil map, the best place to grow any crop is now easily found. With changes threatening in New Zealand's export markets, it becomes more important than ever to find out what each acre of land can be made to produce most profitably. These 16 to 19 year olds are about to tackle three weeks character training at the new Cobham Outward Bound School at Anakiwa, Queen Charlotte South. Once ashore, according to Mr. Jack Phillips, the executive director, they can expect pioneering conditions. The whole idea is based on self-reliance tests evolved during the war for young servicemen. It's sponsored now by industry in search of future leaders. The New Zealand school, costing £100,000 to be established permanently, being fifth in a worldwide chain. From all walks of life, they come to meet the challenge of the great outdoors. Petty Officer Cameron is PT instructor. Mr. John Hebron, bushcraft and mountaineering. And the well-known ocean voyager, Major Hater, sailing. Finally, they meet the warden, Mr. Hamish Thomas of Christchurch, who reports each boy's progress to his sponsor. And then it's six o'clock next morning and the work's begun. One, two, three, four. Now sit right down on these hills. Foster's leg out sideways, keep it straight. First thing to learn is that they can push themselves further than they think. They'll be judged not on how good they are at the start, but how they measure up to challenges. Then comes the confidence course, making a traverse 40 feet up in the trees. every encouragement to keep going, emotionally and physically. Comradeship soon flourishes, for they do everything round the school but cook the meals. And even that they learn before they go for the five-day exploration that ends the course. Marlborough Sounds prove ideal for all their activities. Major Hater takes two crews on their first whaler race. Every man must pull his weight to get the most from these boats. Surprisingly few are experienced outdoors men, considering the opportunities in New Zealand. Canoeing's a challenge not many have tried. Making quick decisions as the river changes course gives them the thrill of accomplishment that sends them back for more. All 
the time the instructions one step ahead, pushing them to the limit before they've time to think what they're doing. For three weeks they're fully extended, learning that by daring and persistence they can accomplish more than they realize. It's this main lesson they'll take back from outward bound to their jobs in everyday life. 